Hey, everybody. It's your friend Adam. I'm here uh, with Jonathan Pujo. We've been talking about having a conversation for a while, and my fans are dying for me to talk to you, just so you know. <laughs> like, That's hilarious. Everybody. Well, I've yeah. been seeing you for years, like just especially, I mean, since the Jordan Peterson thing happened, I've been seeing your videos, watching a few videos, and just kind of seeing you around with Paul Vanderclay and, and different people. So I'm happy to, to talk to you finally. Yeah, I'm, I'm a pro-Christianity uh, atheist. So I, I'm definitely I'm hated on both sides often. So I'm l much less hated by the Christians because obviously I'm a pro I'm pro Christianity. I grew up Christian, so I okay. feel qualified to talk about Christianity because I grew up within the religion. I grew up Southern Baptist, and though I kind of grew into atheism because of my being a fan of science and evolution and all that kind of stuff, I've sort of become an atheist. I still understand the value of Christianity and an ethical system and an ethical package. And really the people that despise me are what I call the anti-theists, which I like to separate the atheists from the anti-theists because atheists just lack a belief in God. A lot of times anti-theists will say, well, an athe atheism is just a lack of belief in God. And I'll think, yes, that's true. But you have a belief in something different. You're an anti-theist. You believe the world would be a better place without religion. Like that's the central... Mm -hmm motivating feature of your ideology. I do not believe the world would be a better place without religion. I, I lack a belief in God. I'm an atheist. You're an anti-theist. Like, uh, so I make that separation, that distinction. Mm -hmm. But we were talking a little bit before we started about, you, you recently did a, uh, a, a talk with Rationality Rules. And I listened to that talk. I thought it was interesting. But I, I agree that with some of the people saying that there was a little bit of talking past one another. So I thought, you know, our it made me want to have a conversation with you even more because I thought uh, we're probably less likely to talk past one another. Mm -hmm. I, ironically, like rationality rules uh, made this video completely savaging me. I made some response videos to him, and I thought he and I would have a constructive dialogue. Uh, that never happened. <laughs> like I'm closer to uh, his position. Uh, uh, like he did a video recently. It's funny because, okay, so let me give the backstory here. I, because I, yeah, I didn't yeah. know about this story. I didn't know this has happened. So, Rationality Rules was making Jordan Peterson videos uh, and just straw manning the hell out of Jordan Peterson. It was driving me crazy. It was driving my fans crazy. So, they wanted me to do response videos because I understand Jordan Peterson's argument. Jordan Peterson's argument is surprisingly close to. Uh, Brett Weinstein's argument about metaphorical truth. So I, I'm doing these videos explaining how uh, rationality rules is completely strawmanning the argument here. Uh, later on, rationality rules does a video where he's all in favor of metaphorical truth, and I'm like, why? <laughs> like, why are you crapping all over Jordan Peterson if you're in favor of what Jordan Peterson is talking about? Just you're not necessarily understanding it. So, so we, I made some response videos to him. He made a response video to me basically just dismissing me as some internet troll. And I'm like, I've been on YouTube longer than you, man. I know everyone on YouTube. I don't necessarily understand where you're coming from. So I thought we were, uh, I would have some kind of a constructive dialogue with him about this stuff. But it's, it's funny to me that now he's kind of making videos that are my position. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so uh, that's actually a good thing. Like in the long run, if he's going to come around to my position anyway, regardless of whether or not we get along, I'm yeah. comfortable with that, but you evidently have a problem with his position, and um, well, I, I saw him. I had been. I've seen his videos, like just anyway. Uh, you know, I've seen all a lot of the different types of atheists and different types of, I, you know, people who have different ideologies on YouTube for years. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've been I've been now on YouTube for about four years, and uh, I'd seen his videos and his kind of um, his anti Jordan Peterson videos. I had written one comment on. He, one of his videos saying that I think that he misunderstands the argument. Um, and we had a little bit of an exchange on one of the videos, but then I thought, I, I don't think we could understand each other. And then recently I did see his video on Brett Weinstein's metaphorical truth. Right. And I was really surprised at some of the things he was saying. And I thought, oh, wait, actually, so if, if he can find some ground in Brett Weinstein's argument, then maybe there could be a point of contact where we could talk at least, at least kind of, try to, to, to understand each other. Cause until then I felt like we'd probably completely talk past each other. 
And, uh, and then he has been really t- super gracious. Like I, he was extremely generous. We had a um, private conversation first to kind of, to just say, okay, look, this is what I'm going to say. Like we're, we don't, we weren't trying, the idea was like, we don't want to trap each other. Like, that's not the point. You really want to try to explore the ideas. Um, and it's been, it's been really positive for me, at least the, the conversation has been positive. I do feel like you said that in the conversation, a few things happened. I think one thing, one thing that happened was we did end up talking past each other on certain points. And I feel like he didn't, he didn't, he hadn't realized the extent to which I'm actually a Christian. And then I think that that surprised him. And so then he was kind of taken off guard because, you know, at some point he, he, he says something like, wait, so you really believe in God? And I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, and then, and then I think that that surprised him a little bit because I, because I think he saw me more on Jordan Peterson's side, let's say. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, in the end, in the end, I, I do feel if you've watched the comment sections on both our channels, it's clear that we we are still talking way past each other because it's very radicalized. Like uh, the com- uh, the comment sections, like on my side, they're saying he didn't understand what I was saying, and on his side, they're saying I'm just trying to speak around. You know, I'm just I'm just just basically saying things to justify my Christian position and not not really you know engaging with the argument. So so it's too bad. Was, I don't know, like, for me, it was like a test. It was like, I'm going to find the person that I feel is kind of the furthest from my position that I could actually talk to. And then, and then try to see if we can understand each other. So yeah. I'm not sure, I'm not sure it happened, but it, I'm not totally giving up yet, let's say. Well, well, personal feelings aside, I think he's cultivated an audience of anti-theists. I, I, I harp on this distinction all the time because it's so important. He has an audience that wants to believe the world would be a better place without religion. Even the LGBT stuff came in in your talk with him. Like a lot of those people who are anti-theists or LGBT activists, they feel religion is dangerous to the LGBT movement, and maybe they have an argument there. Like I don't necessarily uh, disagree with them. In, in America, we have this thing, and I'm sure it's the same. You're in Canadian, right? In, Canada. in Canada, I'm sure it's pretty much the same thing. Like if if you're LGBT and the and uh, the church has prohibitions on LGBT, then you can leave the church. Like nobody's forcing you to stay there. This isn't uh, you know Islam or anything like that. Like uh, go uh, enjoy your life without the church. So I, uh, I as long as it's not being forced upon you, I feel like they have less of an argument there. So mm-hmm. but but. Um, one of the things that I thought we could talk about that would be more interesting is that I feel like I could get past some of the talking past uh, one another that you had with him. Because I, I, the, the thing about uh, Steve or Rationality Rules, whatever he's calling himself these days, uh, you, if that all, I, I'm not sure that he can win that audience over, but he has more of a chance of winning that audience over than either of you, either you or I have. And mm-hmm. I know that when he was making response videos to Jordan Peterson, they very much saw Jordan Peterson as just like this Bible thumper that was uh, winning people over to Christianity. But the reason Jordan Peterson was winning people over to Christianity, I think, is because he was putting a rationalist scientific spin on Christianity that made it make sense for a lot of people who were scientifically minded uh, atheist types. Yeah. So it was just a misunderstanding that rationality rules had about Jordan Peterson that a lot of my response videos were were trying to explain, and um, I, I it's funny that you were probably closer to the type of person that he thought Jordan Peterson was than I think more, Jordan Peterson is. I'm more is. like I'm, yeah. I'm an actual. I go to church. I totally I mean, I don't go to church now because of COVID, but like in a normal world, I go totally. to church. Totally. Yes. And I, you know, and I pray and I have, I have taken on all the traditional practices of a Christian. Like, that's for sure. Do you think Jordan, because we have, you know, this running bet going with Jordan Peterson is like, is Jordan Peterson really just an, like an atheist that, uh, you know, understands Christianity, but he just doesn't want to say he's an atheist because he loses all his street cred? I believe Jordan Peterson is probably closer to the atheist position. I think that he's... The thing, this is the thing about Jordan is that Jordan is what you see. There is, there are no two Jordan Petersons. And that's something 
you know, that is important for people to understand is that it, whatever you see of him, none of it is like a show. Mm -hmm. If you see him hesitating on a question it's because he's hesitating on a question. He's not doing it. He's not doing it as a, as a, as a way to, to, to play a game. Like mm -hmm. I, I had a conversation. I mean, I haven't talked to him a lot, re you know, recently because yeah, he's, he's of the health sick stuff. and everything, but I had a conversation with him uh, maybe about a year and a half ago where he started talking about Genesis again. And he, he was just, he was just like wrestling with the, 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 the thing, like wrestling with the story. And, and then he, he says, what if these stories really were true? Like, what if they were true? And he was excited about it on the phone. And I was like, are you like, really? Jordan? Like, <laughs> I, I was like, come on, man. Like I thought we, I thought like from my side, I thought we were past this, you know, but I think he's really kind of, he's really, uh, wrestling with these questions existentially and so that's what it is so i so i think that he's not an atheist but i think that he doesn't he doesn't have faith mm -hmm. let's say it that way that is there's a difference between saying there's a difference between saying that you believe that god refers to something which it has value let's say something like that mm -hmm. or and faith which is a celebration of that which is above you and a participation in that story so those two things are different so do you want to get into your conception of god For, first of all just since we're talking about the 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 rationality rules talk do, is there anything that you'd like to say that you felt uh, wasn't said there or, or what after you've had some time to reflect on it what what are some of your afterthoughts well, for sure, I really, I do feel like I, I wasn't, like I wasn't able to communicate what I wanted, and so, and it's been helpful to be honest. Like it's been helpful to watch. Paul Vanderclay did a, a comment on the talk, and I've been reading his comment section and my comment section, and so it's been. I think it's going to help me in the end because, you know, these things are hard to talk about, and so I feel like I wasn't able to communicate one basic thing, which is that, the, I could maybe summarize it this way, which is that. I have a, a cosmological frame mm -hmm. and this cosmological frame is actually universal. It actually isn't limited to Christianity. Christianity has some key puzzle elements of that cosmological frame, which I think are extremely important. I would say make Christianity, you know, truer than anything else. But the frame itself is the same in Taoism and in Hinduism and in, and in, and in all the religions, like it's a basic cosmological frame. And that and the, the the applications of that pattern are what cause all the rules in terms of morality that I believe in. And so if you're going to argue against some moral position in the Christian in the Christian worldview, then you have to be able to tell me what it is, first of all, from which position are you arguing that? Because I know, like I have a I have a whole pattern that tells me how a pattern that is as useful to my moral positions than they are to how I build houses and how you build cities and how you organize government. All of these things come down from this cosmological pattern. There's variety. It's not a totalitarian thing. There's variety. So if you're going to tell me that this moral position of Christianity is wrong, then you have to be able to argue your frame to me, not just this position. And you also have to be able to tell me what is the good you're aiming towards. Because I know what the good I'm aiming towards is. Whether so, I succeed or not, we can argue about the application and say this application doesn't lead to that goal. But if you're going to tell me that you it's not good enough and you need something better, you have to tell me what the better is. And I feel like that's the that's the place where we were stuck. Where I was saying, if you if you tell me it's this th this aspect of Christianity is inadequate, then you have to be able to tell me towards what I need to modify it to. If I'm going to modify it towards what? Is it liberty? Is it equality? Is it uh, what is the value? I don't. I'm not sure. I could understand what that is. Is it comfort? Is it more people alive and less people dying? Is it, what is it like? What is the thing you're aiming towards? What is the telos? And so I think that that's the that that was where it, to me at least it stuck, and we were unable to kind of get past that. But I feel like it's maybe because I didn't articulate enough the idea that that. I don't care as much about the the particular laws and rules that you don't like in Christianity because the frame is so powerful 
that I'm willing to even accept some things that I might disagree on in detail because, because it's worth to keep this frame and to live inside this story and to participate in these communities. It's worth it to accept a few things that I might even disagree with. I should, I forgot to mention too, uh, that we're both artists. So I think, <laughs> I think, uh, I think we have that in common, but just back on the, on the topic, the arguing against the morality, I think like I've hung out with these people enough and, you know, I'm, I'm sort of tacitly part of their tribe. I think they would say something to the effect of, of, you know, truth, uh, scientific truth, materialist truth has a higher, sur uh, a higher survival value just because of they always want to point to medical advancements and things like that, that uh, go uh, putting all of our eggs in the metaphorical truth basket would be uh, more detrimental to the survival of more people than to focus on scientific truth. So I think that is really their biggest disagreement or argument against your ethical package that I, I think that they would pull out. So what? So let. So this is something that has come up with Brett Weinstein as well, which is. So on the one hand, you have this evolutionary thinking mm -hmm. and this this like basic scientific thinking, which is also bound up in evolutionary thinking, and these two things are strangely bound up together, and and so. What I hear is on the one hand, I hear people saying that scientific truth is the highest; it's the most important. And then I hear at the same time, the same people saying, we need to break our evolutionary code. Mm -hmm. We need to move out of our evolutionary code because it's dangerous, because it leads to genocide, because it leads to rape, because it leads to all of these horrible tribalistic things. And so they're saying, we need to be able to now, to now transcend our evolutionary impulses. And my question is, again, towards what? Like, where are you standing? Like, if you're if you're not then in the evolutionary camp and mm -hmm. you're in another camp, then tell me what's your camp? Well, like, tell me where you are and what you're aiming towards. What do you think the evolutionary camp is? Let's because you, you're a believer in evolution, right? I mean, you're not. I, I, I think evolution happened. I don't know if I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what would you or believe in it? How about if I. That I, I don't really believe in it, but I, I don't mind it. So say. maybe we're just talking. I don't want to talk past each other. <laughs> like, yeah, I so, don't mind so it. So you, you believe evolution by natural selection is happening today. Uh, you know, the origin of species, you believe in that. I, uh, I think, I definitely think that natural selection Or you think it's true, I very guess. very powerful. It's a very powerful process that has been brought to light in the last, you know, few centuries. Believe is sure. a tough term. I think that's a term we're getting hung up on. You you think uh, you accept that it's true that evolution is happening, evolution by natural selection. Uh, yeah, I'll say yes. That that's fine. I what can, is it? I can say yes. That's okay. Reproduction, variation, selection. I think is yeah what you can that's nail fine. it down to. Okay. This also happens culturally. Do you accept that? That I think so. Cult yeah. Cultural evolution happens through yeah. the same process, right? A bunch of people Similar think process. let's let's try something different. Let's all switch our genders and form a commune and see what happens. Maybe this will be a successful cultural adaptation. If it's not successful, if it doesn't reproduce offspring, it dies out and that cultural uh, mutation dies. Correct. Same way as uh, organisms themselves uh, reproduce and die. Yeah. Well, that 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 has some even in evolutionary terms that has a there's a problem because there's a limited amount of energy you can expound. Sure. And totally. So most yes. evolutionary processes are actually hyper conservative. Very because, much so. Because you have very little energy. And if you start to ex you start to put all your energy in these experimental forms, then you're going to be dead before you have the time to even know whether or not all of these forms you're trying to experiment with were be going to be fruitful. And this is the best argument against the celebrity atheists like Dawkins and Harris and, and those guys, because like religion is all these costly, has all these costly features to it. Uh, evolution is the best argument that religion is doing something useful evolutionarily, or why would it exist? It all we're we're expending all these costly energies, you know, going to church, helping people, meeting other. Uh, you know, meeting together, forming coalitions, all of that stuff has to be evolutionarily advantageous somehow and also or other. Because, 
as re as religion leaves the public sphere, then the birth rate goes down. So sure, exactly that. that too, that too. So, <laughs> so you you are probably in agreement with Brett Weinstein that evolution or that religion is some sort of of extended phenotype. I think is the way that he referred to it in his talk with Richard Dawkins. Which hey, it doesn't bother. I, like I, I obviously do not view the world primarily in evolutionary terms. Right. Like I, I, I interpret the evolutionary terms based on, I, I think that the the frame, the cosmic frame that is given by, let's say, traditional society is more powerful than that. But I, I don't mind it. Like in the sense that I, that I, I, I think it's fine. You know, I think it's okay. But I, I think that when you try to apply these types of patterns to religious thinking what mm. happens is you catch a few things like you catch a few things that are true and a few things connect so you look at the rules and the scripture and you and you're like oh, oh i can explain this through this really this evolutionary process i can explain this but then there's like 80 percent of it that you still think is nonsense but even if you do believe that it's a it's like this emergent thing that happened then it it needs for it to have been selected for it needs to have some coherence Mm -hmm. Or at least some 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 application. Are you talking about so you Christianity can't have specifically? That just total nonsense for thousands of years. You know, I don't think that that that's true. And and the frame that I'm trying to to explain to people makes sense of it all. Like it doesn't. None of it falls up, falls to the side. There's nothing in Scripture which falls to the side if you use the basic cosmic pattern that 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 you find that you find in religion itself. Okay. The I'm not I'm not completely sure what you're meaning on the cosmic pattern but we'll get back to it cuz I just if well I I want you the some one thing that came came up continuously in your talk with rationality rules was like the goal the what's good that kind of stuff so yeah. I just think as, you know as as impartial observers of evolution like we both believe believe it's uh bear, uh reproduction variation selection what is the goal of reproduction variation selection in the context of physical organisms to me it seems like it has to be something on par with utilitarianism like the most well-being for the largest number of people and it's it's perspective oriented because it is going to be the you know obviously what's good for us is not necessarily what's good for chimpanzees <laughs> like there's a reason why humans have dominated this planet and chimpanzees have not right but why is it the most good for the most people i really can't get there with mm -hmm. evolutionary thinking like because because it can be to your advantage to to massively dominate other populations evolutionary like well, in an evolutionary way it's it's way it's your advantage to completely dominate the other lines. Yes, no, so that, I agree. So that your line is a, a disadvantaged. I, I agree. That's why I specifically said that it's perspective oriented, because obviously the utilitarian argument for lions is going to be different than the utilitarian argument for human beings, because the most good for the most people is different than the most good for the most lions. The most good for the most lions is the frame of reference for a lion, though. They're obviously, they would yeah. like to be in the humanity role right now. Uh, and lions will eat the offspring of other lions if they, if yes, they, you yes. know, to, to make but sure that, that is actually continues. That is actually a bad thing in the utilitarian argument, because the 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 most thriving for the most uh organisms in that um in that uh, uh species is going to help because you got to admit the numbers matters especially in an evolutionary game so while different uh different spe uh, di different humans formed different tribes that competed against other tribes a bigger tribe always had a better advantage correct like if I have a hundred people versus ten people, obviously you'd put your money on the hundred people, right? Well, not always. I don't think that's why. <laughs> I know, obviously. No, that's also why. That's why you have moments in history where the small, like Mongolian tribe, comes in and savages the Chinese Empire. Why though? Why? What? What? What is the advantage that they have over the numbers? Well, a because, technological because advantage they have or more flexibility? Okay, so the they have a the better tribe, ethical more... system. Sorry. So they have a better ethical system, a, be a better strategy. Like they if we thought more, of it, they have a better uh, system to dominate because right. 
when you have, let's say you have a, a system which is too big, then it, it had lack flexibility. And so when it, the bigger it gets, the more chance you have of a small thing coming in and piercing the bubble, right? And, right. and because it has massive flexibility, then it can wiggle itself into, into a space and take over. But if you have two teams like that and one has a superior, I, I'm just, I call it an ethical system because that's basically what ethical systems are. They're the rules of engagement between a group. So mm -hmm. if that group has a rule, has an ethical system that allows them to form a, bo a bond of 10 guys that can beat 100 guys, that ethical system, everyone's going to look at and go, that's a good ethical system. I think we should adopt it. And pretty soon that 10 guys is 100 guys. And they can beat a thousand people, right? Yeah. But so that ethical get to system. A thousand, then there's another ten guys. With a different, with a, a different ethical system, maybe. The ethical system will change as societies. That's why societies change. As you as you get rich, mm -hmm. and as you get as you in stabilize, then your world is going to start to look like what you are. It's you can't just you can't you can't be, uh, you know. It's like Jordan. It's like you can't be a boxer. A super aggressive boxer, if 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 at some point you stop fighting for your life, like at some point you're going to lose your edge. Mm -hmm. You need to find ways to keep your edge, but it's going to happen all. It's going to happen by itself, right? It's just going to going to be part of your success is going to be that you're going to lose that edge that you had at the beginning. It's just a normal cycle of things. Well, I, I view Christianity and and different religions as these ethical systems that are uniting people and and allowing people to uh, cooperate with one another. That that's the way that I see these ethical systems. So, so what if we could say that it's not an ethical system? Mm -hmm. I don't think Christianity and I don't think religions are ethical systems. I think that that's one of the problems which makes it hard for people to understand religion is because if you think that they're if they're an ethical system then you don't understand why you have to build an ark of the covenant and have two angels with their wings touching and and you don't understand why you need to to uh, to have you know veils around holy places all of this stuff makes no sense if it's just an ethical system you know it's it's actually more than an ethical system it's a it's a frame of reality it's a it's a way to understand value and to understand, not to understand, but to participate in hierarchies of being. Okay. So that so that so that these hierarchies lay themselves out and create units. So it has more to do with identity than it has to do with ethics. It has more to do with who you are, what your place is in the world, and what's your relationship with others. And then downstream from that, you have rules and regulations and and let's say ways of acting. But in, at first, it's like we worship the thing that unites us. Mm -hmm. We celebrate the thing that unites us. Just like a, a, a basketball team will celebrate their their logo, their mascot. The, 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 they will find rituals to cohere, and they'll have a totem, like a, a mascot, that will go out into the crowd and get everybody to cheer for the team. That's the most important part. It has to do with identification and and uh, social cohesion through participative identity more than the moral stuff. The moral stuff comes down downstream from that. Once you understand that, then a lot of religious stuff is going to make way more sense to you. You know, you're going to understand why people gather together, why they sing together, why they pray together, why they look in the same direction, why they eat a meal together. All of these things are manifestations of particip participation in the same identity under a God, under uh, uh, something which unites them, an identity which unites them together. Well, I, 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 from an evolutionary frame, all of this makes complete sense. So it's, it's, I can understand it from my frame, and I think you can understand it from my frame. I don't, um, I don't know that I completely understand what you're talking about from your frame. Well, no, and that's that's. I mean, that's that's the goal here, right? I mean, what is so, what is what is your goal? What are you what are you trying to accomplish with your YouTube channel and your just talking about this kind of stuff? So, what I'm noticing in the world is. A breakdown. Mm -hmm. There's a breakdown going happening. Mm -hmm. There's a fragmentation of identities. There's a fragmentation of of all the places which in which we find our communion, or in which we find unity, are breaking down. 
and people are just surfing through surfing as if this is normal but at some point it's going to move towards more chaos riots all of this stuff the chaos that we see that we saw in in 2020 and it's also going to move towards authoritarian clampdowns because one of the problems which happens when normal identity starts to fragment is that there's an overcompensation on the other side and so what i'm seeing down line is very dark there's a very dark uh horizon and one of the reasons why it is, is because we've ceased to understand what makes things exist as one. Like, why do we think that nations have identity? Why do we think families? Why do we think a person has unity? And this is because we've lost the cosmic frame. We've lost the frame, this traditional hierarchy of being, which, which is shown in the temple, in the church, in the, in the story of Genesis, and all of these images that help us to understand and participate in how things are one. Jordan talks about this all the time, which is the problem of, John Vervick uses the words combinator, combinatorial explosion. There's too much stuff in the world. Like there's just too much phenomena. And so there are ways in which phenomena phenomena coalesces into identities in which you're able to see that uh, a chair has parts, but is also one. Like, why do we think that a chair is one thing? It's not one thing. It's a million things. It's, and, and why do you think that that chair is participates with other furniture and we can see it as one room? And why do we see one room as one house or one house as one, you know, these, all these houses as one city? There are processes by which this is possible. And if we attack ritual and we attack the notion of concentric spaces or the idea of the way in which society communes, then it's going to become the suburbs. All of reality is going to become the suburbs. It's going to become a flat, a flat a distribution of particles that have no coherence. It's going to happen in the way we build houses. It's going to happen in our morality, where everybody has their own morality. It's going to happen in our identities, where everybody has their own identity. And there's nothing joining us together. And we're going to not know our neighbors, which is already happening. We don't know our neighbors. We don't know the people next to us. We have nothing binding us. There's no glue. And that glue is ritual. It's based on concentric. It's based on worshiping the same thing. No, I, I agree. You have to this celebrate is, the same thing in order to be together. This is Jordan Peterson's uh, idea of God. God is the thing that you orient yourself towards, and different communities orient themselves towards different things. Like I would say the social justice community is oriented towards uh, fighting for the rights of the oppressed. That is yep. their, technically their God, because that's, that's what right. they're orienting themselves. The anti-theists, they orient themselves towards the world would be a better place without religion. That is their God. That is the God that they serve every day yes. with every video so, that they make. They're trying but, to tr turn everyone else into anti-theists. <laughs> well, actually, and, you know, by extension into scientists, because they worship truth. They think religion is bad because... It doesn't worship uh, truth over over well being, even no, they, though it's they funny that factuality <laughs> is what they worship. Well, but you said one thing. I think I think I want to go back to the the fragment. You see fragmentation as a problem. I'm torn over whether or not the fragmentation is due to material conditions or whether it's due to a philosophical breakdown. I think there's good arguments for both, but yeah, I they go they go together. Yeah, they, I mean, they do. They kind of feed off of one another because you're... I mean, Christ, that's why Christianity has an ascetic aspect to it, right? The idea that we accumulate all this stuff, we think that it's good in itself is not necessarily, not necessarily this is, so. <laughs> that's, see, that's where the philosophy shapes the material conditions because yeah. if you're living in horrible material conditions, it's helpful to have a philosophy that makes you enjoy n not having anything. <laughs> well, the guy... Well, monks could live in very uh, lavish conditions if they wanted to, they choose not to. Right. Like monasticism is a voluntary choice. It's not a. It's not a. It's not caused by the outside world. It's. It's. It's the the ascetic spirit of Christianity is can flower even in the empire. Like even if when Constantinople was the most glorious city in the world, there were still monks, you know, standing on pillars and and living in caves. So the the ascetic tendency is not 
is not just based on uh, material. It's not just based on a lack of material possibility. There's something else in the ascetic thing. But I just want to say one thing about what you said in terms of the gods. And I think you're right. They really are gods. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems we're seeing, one of the things we saw in the last few thousand years is through Christianity, through Islam, through Judaism, through Neoplatonism, and and other and other versions of tradition, some aspects of Hinduism, like let's say uh, Vedanta Hinduism, there's this idea that the gods stack up, and so the identities of these different things they stack up, and they they stack up towards something which is goes moves towards a point, and you could call that point being, you could call it you know, the origin, there's all ways of, of talking about it, but it, they, they stack up. So it's like you have modes of being, let's say that social justice God, you know, the God of war, the God of money, the God of this, you have all these gods and they're all competing and they're competing in society, but they're also competing in you, right? So you have desires. Not me. <laughs> Those desires are fighting amongst each other and you can feel the same. You can feel two, you can feel two at the same time, right? You yeah, love someone definitely. and hate them at the same time. And it's ripping you apart. And so the let's say the the Christian answer, and it's not just a Christian answer, but is that there's a way to unite those into a single mode of being which unites all other modes of being, and that's the movement towards the transcendent God, which it, who is not like all the other gods. It's not that you can't. One of the problems that people, when people, the, the kind of weird atheist argument, which is that. Like everybody's an atheist. You just believe in, you know, you just believe in one more. I just believe one less, one less God, God than yeah. you do, right? Yeah. It's like, no, that's not true. I believe in all the gods. I think all the gods exist. But the 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 infinite transcendent is not the same as all these particular gods. Just like just like in order to unify the different cities of the United States, you need us, you need an identity which is higher, which is the state. And if you want those states not to fight amongst each other, you need an identity higher, which is mm -hmm. the country. And so right. you need these transcendent identities in order to unify things below them. So the in the context that I said, like uh, an idea can become a god in the sense that it's some uh, idea that a community orients around. Social justice, uh, we talked about... Um, anti-theism we talked about what would be the i the central idea that christianity rolls around i i have my idea but my idea is through an evolutionary framework obviously so but your idea and everything that you're saying i don't disagree with anything that you're saying i'm just i'm kind of translating it into an evolutionary framework in my mind yeah that i so the, i think it's love love yeah okay and so what love love what love does is that it is the the balance of the unity and multiplicity. Mm -hmm. Let's and so love is when you can have let's say unity amongst people, mm -hmm. but that unity doesn't dissolve the difference, the multiplicity. You know, it's like if you love someone, you don't you don't like suck them into you. You don't like you you know just like it's like like the way that you that you like to eat something that type of desire that's not what christian love is you don't you don't make everything the same through love you there's a a there's a let's say there's a a recognition of the unity and also a recognition of the multiplicity at the same time and it creates this kind of balance or this this dance between one and many and i think that that's what that's what that's the the highest value of Christianity, and it manifests itself in the incarnation, where mm -hmm. Christ is seen as both fully transcendent, fully God, fully you know, and at the same time fully incarnate, fully multiple, fully linked down all the way down into death, you know. And so it's like there's this joining of of absolute fragmentation and multiplicity in all the way into death with the ultimate transcendent uh, principle. You're you're expert at talking in the metaphorical truth uh, frame. <laughs> like so much of this is, I can see this does driving. Does it make sense? You are does that sound like I'm just spouting gibberish? I hope I'm not. A little. It's I I I can understand it and and respect it because I respect the idea behind metaphorical truth. But I think a lot of like scientifically minded types, it sounds like gibberish too because they don't they can't necessarily grab onto it into in a like a materialist type framework 
You okay, are so you are talking about hierarchy. Let me use a scientific example. Okay. Right. And so you have a transcendent principle, mm -hmm. right? That's you could call it a theory. Is it? Is it? Okay. So okay, it's so it's like the theory of evolution. So that's a like pattern, a, a okay? yeah. You have a pattern. Right. And Selection, that, variation, uh, re reproduction. It it doesn't matter which one it is. Okay. Any scientific theory will do. And that is a, a pattern. Mm -hmm. And that what that pattern does is, first of all, it tells you what to look at. Mm -hmm. Because you could look at a million things in the world. Sure, totally. So the theory, first of all, frames what you're talking a about. A little slice of reality. It right, fl it frames, frames the slice. Mm -hmm. And then it also gives you the parameters by which the pattern of this thing is going to happen. Okay, mm -hmm. So that's the heaven of that scientific thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a earth, a mm -hmm. lower part, and that's all the multiplicity of facts which you encounter, that, all the variety that, of facts that, that, that the you pattern encounter. creates in sort of a fractile type sense. Yeah, but it doesn't just create right. them. It also kind of, it, it, it uh, let's say, it has to recognize them also. Right. right. It's not just about creating them because those those pa those facts, you know, have have a way of speaking like they 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 they, you know, and sometimes the facts will start to contradict the theory. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to find a way to balance the theory with the facts. Correct. If you un if it's not balanced, then either the theory will like start to crush the facts and will start to suppress the facts that they don't that it doesn't like so that it will continue to make the theory look plausible yeah so it'll start to marginalize facts this is where the metaphorical the truth comes in right here this it's is like, not we... metaphorical this is what happens right well definitely yeah if, if right. it's not if, metaphorical it's like if this is scientific so you you have facts and you're looking at them through your theory but some of them don't fit if a if a few of them don't fit that's fine Mm -hmm. Right, you kind of leave them to the side. Yeah, but if a lot of them, then you start to push them, push them, push them. At some point, the theory is no overturned. Yeah, it's going to split apart, and this, the, the the theory and the facts will just won't fit together anymore. Correct. Yes, reality will stop to be coherent. Well, the th what, what would they do in science? though, is they throw the theory away. They say, That's right. okay, we need a new theory. theory. Yeah, you need a theory which is more explains these facts better. These new we, facts, exactly. Yeah, and so that, but when the theory mm -hmm. and the facts are together mm -hmm. and there's a balance between the unitive capacity that the theory offers and the the the, the variation at the bottom mm -hmm. that's love <laughs> see that's, and then you go to something that's completely subjective a it's completely not, love is not subjective well, how's love subjective well there's different uh different types of love there's like loves that love that you have for your family and then there's love that you have for like your wife which is, is well, so let's let's use let's use the christian agape love there's That's love that you have for your I brother talk about, I talk about christian there's love. love that you have for your friends the i don't disagree on the love thing but there's a specific aspect of the love in christianity one of the reasons why i think christianity has dominated the world and and has so many adherents and so many people. I mean, going back to the example that I have of, of those 10 tribes with the 10 guys with the superior ethical system that could beat a hundred guys, that ethical system of Christianity is spread around the world because it's so incredibly useful, especially yeah, in modern, in modern times. One of the hardest things uh, to do in society is to uh, foster an attitude of forgiveness uh, forgiveness makes the modern world possible. <laughs> like yep. a lot of accidents happen, a lot of uh, terrible things go on. If people aren't able to let go of those terrible things, they can consume a lot of their resources, a lot of their family resources, a lot of their individual resources, a lot of their tribes' resources. Like uh, we have a lot of contention going on in politics and whatnot. I until somebody has the capacity to step up and say, okay, let's start over. I'm going to forgive everything that's happened up until then, and I encourage you to do the same. Let's move forward with a fresh slate. Like, things can go off the rails. This is how genocides happen, right? Yeah. Things spin yeah. in the wrong direction. So, but, but the center of the Christian narrative is a dude on the cross forgive, yeah. uh, doing this grave act to forgive the world for all of the injustice in it. So, I mean, that is a powerful idea. And it definitely plays into the love thing that you're talking about, but it's it's more specific than that because it does take a, an extreme type of love 
to forgive your enemies. Yeah. <laughs> like it's easy to love your uh you know, love your neighbor, love your family, love yeah, your love, love your, your friends, but that... to love the guy across the street that's been a pain in your ass yeah. like as long as you've lived there. Yeah. That, that's an extreme type of love. And I think the the uh the a, Christian narrative that like the love your enemy thing it's important to understand it it is that one of the problems of reality is that the these hierarchies let's say the, the hierarchies of tribalism the hierarchies of identity mm -hmm. they're inevitable you can't avoid them they have to exist or else the world stops to exist the world ceases to exist and so how do you deal with it and so a lot of the christian answers are something like that which is love your enemy and so mm -hmm. love your enemy doesn't mean he's not your enemy Right? It's not saying this person is not your enemy. It's saying this person is your enemy, but you have to find it in yourself. And you could, you could, you could still defend yourself. Actually, like in terms of Christian understanding, in terms of a country, like no Christian country would ever say you need to let yourself get invaded by other countries. But, but the idea is you need to also be able to continue to see the humanity of the even the person that's attacking you, and to see that they share something in common with you, even though they are your enemy. Yeah. And so, and so that's, those are the kinds of answers that Christianity gives, which are based on this finding a balance between the unity and multiplicity, like this finding this space where you have the best relationship between, you know, the tribal aspect and also this openness towards the outside. All of this is, all of this is manifest itself in the incarnation. So you said one thing also in your previous talk that, I didn't quite understand because the argument that you seem to be making is, which I completely agree with, that the only way that you can really change an, a, a system or a group or an identity or, or a, a community is from within. And the implication that you made was the really you need to join Christianity and cha help change Christianity from within. But that argument applies to any group. Uh, I completely agree with you that the only the only people who are going to listen to you are people within your tribe. Uh, other people will tend to dismiss you, but until you, I mean that that attitude is uh, also applies to communism, which I wouldn't imply. I, would, I wouldn't advise anyone to join the communist community and improve it from within. So yeah, well, communism is is deficient at the outset. It's yeah, it's, it's a not, bad ethical it's not the package. same at all. Yeah, like trying to put communism on the same level as traditional religious systems is just really it's it's really hogwash. It's just not. It's it really isn't. Uh, which but is but why do you it, do understand? We're we're in agreement though that you can conceptualize religion as as a thing that a people orient around and communism is a thing that people orient around and therefore can be conceptualized as like a, a Durkheimian view of religion can be conceptualized as a religion. It's like social justice can be conceptualized well, as a religion. Everything can become a religion. Yeah. Money can become a, that's why we have the idea of idolatry in, in, in Christianity. Money. I, how the, my, I'm maybe I'm, Specifically, I'm talking about a goal or a cause that a community orients itself around. So making money, like, like I don't know that money itself can become a religion, but like um, I would conceptualize any corporation that you know works together to make money by doing some service or product could be conceptualized as a religion. Not necessarily. Yeah, we could understand that the god of the god of of uh, of our system is money, like mm -hmm. or mammon, and the god of the communist system is this weird equality thing, and so it's like they worship equality, mm -hmm. and so and and then they want to make the world in the image of equality, uh, and it's actually probably worse than the other one because it obviously it self destroys in just a few generations. Like it, communism doesn't just doesn't have legs. It as soon as you in, in as well, soon as you put it together, it, I don't want to get I don't want to get sidetracked on communism because I yeah. could very easily. But the <laughs> the I the, okay, so the, the argument about the, the about argument the that you're making, I didn't understand, and I I yeah. think other people, if I didn't understand it, other people didn't understand it. So maybe you could make it clearer. What like yeah, what so exactly you are you advocating for? You have to understand it in the general context of what I said. I I I did wasn't able to communicate properly, which is that. 
I have a, a cosmic mythological frame in which I exist and participate and and I live in. Mm -hmm. Now you're standing somewhere and you're telling me there are aspects of your mythological, your aspects of what you're doing, which is wrong. And and my question is, okay. I, I'm saying that about no, you? No, no, like the, 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 the critique of the new atheist, let's say, mm -hmm. or the critique of the atheist type, right. which is that this practice of Christianity is is wrong. Because it's factually that. incorrect. Yes. Well, it's not. It's not about prescriptions that are not factual descriptions. Well, no, the, the, but I'm just saying that's what their critique would be. Their critique would be you believe untrue things. Believing untrue things is dangerous because the next thing you know, you're a suicide bomber. Like that's the, basically their <laughs> argument. No, yeah, I, exactly. am I wrong? I mean, that's basically their argument. They're I, like, if you can be like tricked, that. I'm like, uh, everyone believes untrue things. There's like, you can't get out of bed without believing untrue things because. Like there's things that you don't have the facts on. And there's also, this is the thing is that this is what, I mean, we're getting sidetracked again, but there are, this is going to be hard for people to, under, to, to understand, which is that there are truths which are more immediate to you mm -hmm. than scientific truths. Scientific truths I agree. are actually abstractions most of the time. Do you, are you a fan of Donald Hoffman? Do you... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm a huge Donald Hoffman fan. So when yeah. Donald Hoffman and Verveke are really going at the same kind of ideas from different perspectives. Verveke's more on the philosophical side and Donald Hoffman's more on the scientific side. Yeah. So but I, think I Don agree Hoffman with makes you. a mistake. He, he he makes a mistake in his original premise, which is fine because he's a scientist, but he makes a mistake in his original premise, which is that we experience illusions mm -hmm. and 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 there is this other thing behind, which is more true than what we experience, right. but we can't experience it. And I'm like, okay, I don't know. Why don't you posit your experience as the first frame and then the rest as secondary? So like the experience that we have, that's all our meaning is made out of it. Mm -hmm. Like all our meaning is made out of that experience. And so I'm not saying that scientific truths are untrue. Of course they're true. But they're, they're, they're secondary to that first experience. Like you don't experience H2O. You drink, you experience wet. You experience cold. Mm -hmm. you, these are the first categories. The, uh, and the, the, and they're, they're not subjective. They're personal, like, because they're human experiences. But everybody has similar, has, it's a universal personal experience. But you don't experience molecules. You don't experience atoms. You don't experience the solar system, like you, you, all of these things are not, are abstractions from your experience and they're, they're, they're useful and they're, they're valuable, but they come after, they come after the first experience. Well, Do Donald Hoffman would say, yes, it's all experience. Uh, so I don't, I don't disagree with you there. The, just to bring it back to the Christianity thing, I, do you believe the world would be a better place if everyone was Christian? Is that is that your position? Or well, I if mean, I believe that the world would be a better place if everyone was Christian. Well, the the impl that's kind of the implication when you say you know I have this frame of reference. We have like, no, okay, the best so, uh, yeah, way of looking at the argument. world. What I mean is that I have this frame mm -hmm. and I have ways of knowing what's good inside of it, mm -hmm. and I have these ways of of making it better. And you standing in a place that I don't know where you are. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, let's say in the, my discussion with rationality rules, he's standing in a place that I don't know where he is. He's tell, talking to me about a good that he won't define. Mm -hmm. Yet he's telling me that I should improve my thing. It's like, I, I don't know what you want from me. Like, where should I go? Where, tell me where to stand. Tell me where to, where, tell me what's your frame and then, and, and, and help me understand it so that I can evaluate. But for now, like this seems way superior to whatever it is you're offering me because mm -hmm. you're offering me something which is vague and imprecise and a good that I don't, that I can't, that I can't really uh, identify. And so it's like, this is where I am. I'm speaking out of, I know what I'm speaking out of. Like I know what my frame is, but I don't think you do. The, the major contention that came out of the dialogue there was over the LGBT stuff. He was basically yeah. saying, uh, you have an ethical package that 
five uh, percent of the population can't use because they're homosexual and the ethical package dis, uh, uh, castigates their entire lifestyle so the ethical package is unavailable to them yeah i know i think that my my difficulty with that is several fold well he would say change your ethical package he would say make your ethical package inclusive of uh, homosexual lifestyles and we're having a conversation what about well no he would he wouldn't say that because obviously the truth well, what you about have the truth bestiality there. lifestyles see that's just that's just what about ism the no it's not what about ism we just literally said what about <laughs> no but what i mean is that if you have to give me a reason why to change it. If, if, I don't disagree that 20 years behavior, from now, 20 are, years from now, there's an indefinite amount of patterns of behavior mm -hmm. that exist. And those indefinite amounts of patterns of behavior can also say, why don't you accept my behavior? Well, my, my, my understanding of the world is there are different strokes for different folks. Like different people will b utilize different ethical packages more successfully. Like I think we're in a better situation if we have uh, 10, 15% of the population that are atheist scientific types. <laughs> and uh, why, why are you laughing? I'm dead serious. Okay, no, yeah, sure. Like if we have 10, 15% of the population, when you have a football team, you have an offense and a defense, right? You have different positions for different people. Like it doesn't, you can't form a football team if you have, you know, everyone is a quarterback. That team yeah. is not going to be successful. But I see a, a lot of our ancient software is if we don't go kill the tribe over the hill, they're going to come and kill us. Therefore, we, we're in a safer world if everybody is the same as us. That That's ancient ancient primal programming and a lot of the the disagreements that i see online are people just advocating for their tribe saying i would feel much safer in a world where everyone was christian or i would feel much safer in a world where everyone was lgbt or i would feel much safer in a world where every no one believed in 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 religion because they might become a suicide bomber and end up on the bus that i'm on this is this is really the dialogue that we're having but really the the system that we need to work on and and i think brett weinstein is is brilliant in illuminating this fact the system that we need to work on is the system that interfaces between the ethical packages because in certain ethical packages you have kill all apostates kill anyone who's not inside our group that's a bad thing because that that ethical package becomes caustic to the rest of the ethical packages and it's helpful to have uh, fit 10 to 15 percent of the population that's atheist scientific types working on medical advancements that everybody benefits from. They don't necessarily believe in evolution, but when they show up at the hospital, they have help. There's help for them. There's help for them and their family. So, uh, so what what is your position on on that multi the multiplicity of ethical packages? So this is the thing. This is also in terms of. First of all, like I said, one of the difficulties that religion is is not first and foremost an ethical an ethical package. Mm -hmm. It is it is a it is a communal package. It's a package which makes us know that we are in communion with each other, that we have things in common that help us to see each other as together so you could see it that I, way uh, you, everything that you're saying goes along with my beliefs yeah. maybe the term ethical package is no, incorrect and, but and in that there's a hierarchy of practices sure yeah and so there are things which are high up on the normative ladder and there are things which are low on the normative ladder and there are things which are considered sinful now the thing about the sinful part is that everybody sins yeah, it's not like there's a particular type of person that sins and everybody else doesn't. Sin is just a normal part of reality, and so the idea that certain behaviors are prescribed as sinful doesn't mean that they don't exist because we, everybody sins, and that's one of the aspects of Christianity is to say, "Don't judge your neighbor, don't judge your, the other," because you also have that in you. The way that you're framing this is completely offensive to the atheist types. Yeah. I want you to know because you're you're basically um 
I'm asking you about the- It's so much better though, because you don't have the totalitarian move in what I'm saying. There's no totalitarian move. Because you can't say. So, so are you saying now that the atheist, the atheist, like we're comparing a, a Christian? You're, I'm talking about the peaceful cohabitation of the atheist tribe and the Christian tribe, and you're saying the atheist tribe is always going to become totalitarian? No, not like always. how is that? Oh, not well, always. I mean, Just forty percent of the time, fifty percent of the time. No, no, no. But what I mean is that the idea of having a normal hierarchy of norm, norm normativity. Uh huh is the way that you kind of deal with this stuff. And so and so the idea is that there so let's say in terms of sexuality, the I, Christian sexuality, traditional Christian sexuality is radical. Mm -hmm. Like it is very radical. It says all sexuality, even your thoughts has to be geared towards uh, a, a monogamous relationship which is in the pattern of of procreation. Yeah. Like that's, That's a, a great, radical, how can you right. not see the evolutionary advantage of that? Right, exactly. And also, everybody sins. Mm -hmm. So yeah. everybody falls short of that. Everybody. No one doesn't fall short of that. And so that's the that's the way that Christians have approached it. And so the idea that in Christian societies, there are, are always behaviors which go outside of that that goal is just normal. It's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, so homosexual behavior has always been part of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Adultery has always been part of Christianity. Masturbation has always been part of Christianity. It was prescribed, but it was also understood. But, but that you're, everybody is tainted by it. Everybody for has framing that, it though as sin as something that is a, missing the mark. At framing it as sin though is offensive to people who don't view it as sin. They have a different what's ethical the, package. What's the mark of sexuality? Well, I listen. <laughs> In an we, evolutionary term, what's the mark? When do you hit the bullseye? When you when you reap term? grandchildren. There you go. Yeah. So missing the mark means going right, but, aside from that. But they would the the they would argue that they live in a society where it's not necessary for every single person to be churning out children, and that they might live a more meaningful life to them if they forego having children and have a same-sex marriage or even not have a same-sex marriage, but screw around with every single person that they come in contact with. Like maybe that's their uh, beautiful life, their thriving life. Uh, there always have been people who do that. It's, it's not like... Yeah, but they Christian aren't welcome inside the Christian... That. They aren't welcome inside the Christian church, though. They, they're... You think prostitutes don't go to communion once a year? Well, okay. <laughs> I'll, my, we're, we're getting away from my point here my point no, it's important it's a really important uh, it's it's because we're so used to like weird totalitarian systems what? where we think that everything which is illegal there's going to be a cop at your door putting you in jail but in, in normal societies that's not how it works do you the fact you... that there are prescribed actions doesn't mean that they're all enforced through like the force of police state if a if a if a person wants to live a LGBT lifestyle, have a same-sex marriage, maybe adopt kids even, uh, if they become a part of Christianity, I don't necessarily think it's going to be a comfortable fit for them. I mean, I have friends that are gay and Catholic and just love it. So, I mean, it's definitely not without the realm of, uh, outside the realm of possibility. I've seen it happen. But... Uh, it becomes a private question. It becomes a question of private life right. and a private relationship with your priest, with your confessor, with, you know, it becomes something which is not in the normative uh, prescription of the system. But it, it, like I said, we all have those. It, it has, has those things that aren't normative. It has entered the public sphere, though, when you have... Uh, laws against gay marriage being funded by the Mormon church. So it there, it definitely does enter the, the public space in ways that are not necessarily good in a utilitarian way for, for everyone. Well, that just depends. What, what exactly is the purpose of gay marriage? The purpose of gay marriage is for people, for freedom, liberty, people to be able to pursue the lifestyle that they want. The, the whole reason that we're able to... Have. What is the purpose of marriage? Like, what what is what was the traditional purpose of marriage? Uh, the body system, like, well, in the modern, no. Not, no, the traditional purpose was to have kids, but the, it's changed over time. Now it's more the buddy system. It's so you have 
someone that you can share your life with. So, so it's like, yeah. So it's basically living together with a contract. Is that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Contract. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to leave me. It's the buddy system. So, but yeah, I mean, so just, you, you understand that marriage can, can function in different ways as well. Right. Christianity has a specific way of defining marriage that works for Christianity. That way of defining marriage is not going to work for everyone. And what I'm saying is it's better to have a world where we have different groups that pursue different avenues of thriving, and those groups uh, have a system for interacting with one another that doesn't end up in genocide. I agree with the last part for yeah. sure so, in terms of not ending up in genocide. Right. But you also have to be careful not to like I mean not I, I'm not convinced a I'm not that convinced. Is so diverse that it's like chocolate pudding and then someone's going to come in with a knife and cut you up. I I'm not convinced that if the shoe was on the other foot and the LGBT community had the numbers that they wouldn't genocide the Christian community. I'm not convinced that that numbers. wouldn't happen. Yeah. Well, they can't have the numbers. They can't have the numbers because the LGBT is like 5% of the population. Yeah. No, but I'm saying like the the LGBT community is worried about the Christians genociding them. Like they basically made No, but they have a they have total they have reason to. My goodness. Yeah, like, okay, so we're in agreement. I totally agree. Look, yeah. I think that a lot of the stuff that we're seeing now is because of an excess of of insane regulation that happened in the 1950s and the early 20th century, like castrating, chemically castrating people and putting people in jail and all this insane stuff that happened in terms of yeah. attacking people's yes. lifestyles. Yes, exactly. I think that that's crazy. Well, like, I think that that is what led to, uh, to, to, to the, the movement. And so I have a lot of sympathy for, for what happened. Like I totally understand, you know, I don't think, I think that in a normal traditional world, there's a lot more flexibility for people to live out their idiosyncrasies, you know, and it, there isn't this like weird police state enforcement of people's private lives. Like, you, you know, you just, well, well, there's, there, there's room. Like I said, traditional societies have always had prostitutes. Like prostitution is just part of, you can prescribe it and then also not enforce, not enforce it. It just happens. It is part of society. You say that's taboo but it's still going to be there. And that's the same with all kinds of other behaviors, which has, have always existed from all time. And so I think that the, the modern clampdown on, on the pathologization of homosexual behavior, which happened actually with scientific reasons, you know, led to a crazy backlash. Like it was actually more the scientists that ended up castrating homosexual than the Christians. The, the, the behavioral, the, all the behavioral psychologists, all of these people who who said that it was the disease that needed to be, that needed to be cured and needed to be, you know, yeah. that's a modern phenomenon. It's not an ancient phenomenon. The the system, the the thing that I'm talking about, the system for interaction between systems. I think Christianity has an advantage on developing that system because it it has the one ethic that is important that that must be in this like system to system uh, management ethics package basically mm -hmm. and that is the the love thy neighbor or love thy enemy thing because if there's any conflict between those tribes like the tribalism is so embedded in our psychology that that tribalist program takes over so quickly that if you don't have that forgive the enemy ethic involved in your in your ethics package there's no way that you can stop that like we're down the road yeah to the next genocide so th this is the these are the things that I think you know Brett Weinstein is talking about a lot I think rationality rules was talking about in your conversation with him but not necessarily as specifically as I'm talking about them yeah uh, but you need you would need to so if if you want to create something which navigates a super system, between let's call the, it the super exactly, system. The, the problem with the super system is that it's it's being brought about by people who 
don't aren't aware that 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 the system is not arbitrary. No, like, nobody's they, driving the ship now, John. Exactly. Come on. And so, and so, I I'm afraid of anybody who wants to place themselves above the systems. Like I'm really afraid of that because they have a blind they have a blind side. Like they they're blinded by by something and that they think that they can stand outside. We definitely want the right, else. we want the right people in charge of it. I totally agree with you. Well, actually it's better if they, if we don't have anyone in charge of it, I believe in institutions. Like we need to build institutions that allow <laughs> terrible people to do that, that basically force terrible people to do the right thing. We want an institution that's strong enough that even if terrible people grab the reins, there's not too much damage that they can do. The yeah. building institutions is the important thing. Well, for sure, the U.S. the U.S. system, at least, what seems like that's what it was made for. It yes. seems to have lasted for a while. It's it might be, it might be stretched to its don't, limit. Don't right talk now. like that. Don't talk like. <laughs> don't. Uh, we're doing just fine down here. You're doing just fine. Okay, that's good. Sorry, I'd have to stop paying attention to. Mm -hmm. You, to 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 what's being said on Twitter, that's for sure. I only have about fifteen uh, fifteen or twenty minutes left, but I I want to talk about something before we go because right, go you're it. in a very a very famous video with Jordan Peterson and is it I think it's Brett Weinstein yeah. where you're talking where Brett Weinstein makes an argument and you guys never really get back to the argument. I don't think Brett Weinstein even finishes the argument, but the argument yeah. is that. So the argument is what we're talking about. Science is the super system because science is the, the way that we mitigate between the other systems. I don't I don't know that I totally agree with that. Science is a component of the super system, but the super system has to be has to have a moral component as well. And we both know where science falls down, like science yeah. is not prescriptive, but it's descriptive. descriptive. Yeah, it's exactly. Prescriptive. But the super system needs to be proscriptive. Like, obviously, it has to have. Uh, yeah, it has, all of our all of our ethical packages are proscriptive. That's the whole point of the ethical package. Yeah, it has to have it has to be able to identify the good towards which it's aiming. Yeah. So and you so, so in that in that talk, just to just to sum it up, uh, they were uh, you're you're talking about the various systems. Christianity is one of the systems, but Brett Weinstein makes the argument that science is the is the highest, the top of the hierarchy, and I know. Like your one of your things is hierarchy, so I could see. Yeah. Oh, he's getting triggered here. He doesn't well, like this. <laughs> it has to be. So I would think about this a lot. I think that a good way to understand science. Is well, that let, it, let's give it, the background a little more for people who haven't oh, yeah, necessarily okay. heard it all. Do, so do you, you were there. That's why I'm. Do you what? Yeah. What exactly happened there? Well, it was mostly about. It was mostly about this this idea of, mm. of the. The problem, because I did, I did a video on the 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 idea of metaphorical truth. Because he made Brett made a video on metaphorical truth, mm -hmm. where he talked about how he was saying that science is the higher truth, science is is above the other truth. Right. And I was trying to point into him the 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 performative contradiction, which is that he was using metaphor <laughs> to to make science higher. Right. You know, and I was and I was joking in the video. I said said I looked at it on the top shelf of my of my room and I couldn't find science like it just wasn't there. And so it's like I, I, I if I stack science on top of a pile of other things, it's like if you're if you go down into the materialist scientific frame, this idea of a hierarchy just doesn't make any sense. So your your argument is that if you're going to make an argument that science is higher than metaphor, you're literally using a metaphor to make <laughs> to that argument. It. Yeah. I mean, that which, was kind of which like makes funny, sense. So you're, you're saying metaphor is, are you saying, but I don't necessarily understand because I understand Brett's argument. Brett's argument is there are all these ethical systems. Uh, they all believe different and contradictory things. Science is the only one that can discern truth among those things in a materialist way. Therefore, if you are, if truth is really what you're looking for, because there's also well-being, like one system may be terrible at truth, but they are very good at well-being. Like uh, the people who live there are very happy. None of them believe anything in the real world, but they're so happy. They're producing kids. They're thriving over time. Uh, so one of the things that I'm always talking about is uh, the one of the 
ironies of the world is where like truth and well-being often diverge. So the anti-theist community, they want to see truth and well-being be on the same page, but it's that's not necessarily how the world works. So, but you understand the argument that Brett is making. You're just making kind of it, a I technical. I, I definitely disagree. Okay, so how do you disagree? That's it. That's well, it. I disagree because the jump between different levels of all reality is not a scientific jump. Mm-hmm. There, you cannot. You have to take a category for granted before you analyze it. Mm-hmm. The an, the analysis of a category will not give you the category. But you analyze it how? Because Brett would so, say, so anat- science, science science is taking bounded taking bounded phenomena and then giving a description, mm-hmm. which is good enough so that maybe you can predict what's going to happen, mm-hmm. right? And so you 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 bound a phenomena and then you describe it in a way that is 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 so good that then you can actually predict other versions of it or how it's going to act, let's say, how it's going to, how it's going to continue. Right. And so that is what scientific things do. But the category of a car is not a scientific category. Mm-hmm. You need the category first before you analyze the car. You need the category of a mountain before you analyze a mountain. Okay. The, the world is fluid. Like the boundaries between phenomena are permeable. But there are di- different they're ways not to hard. analyze a category though. Sorry? There are different ways to analyze a category. Like, right, but the, 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 the scientific, science, all it does is analyze the categories. For truth. For truth But the values. categories That's are it. not scientific themselves. Science only, an, science only analyzes for materialist truth claims. That's all it analyzes for. For it, it annu- analyzes for factuality. Yes. Right? Yeah. But it doesn't. It doesn't give you even the categories. Mm-hmm. It's like a river is not is a is a, a river is a category of meaning. So if you're going to study what lives in a river, that that ca- a species are. It's like why do we think that species we have arbitrary not arbitrary we have meaningful ways of differentiating species, but those are not in the you can't find them in the 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 actual analysis of the category. What what would be your rebuttal? What would be your argument? So, uh, or your rebuttal to Brett's argument? So, if Brett is saying that science is the only way that you can study how the study the truth claims between the various ethical systems or religions, whatever you want to call them, um, and he, he's saying that's why that's the that is the defining factor of science over the different systems what you and you're saying no science is you're saying so, so what is what is the science highest is at the bottom of the hierarchy but in right. a good way okay not in a bad at the way. bottom of the hierarchy in a very good way because what it does is it helps you understand how things work mm-hmm. right and so for example like the top let's say a car right mm-hmm. the top of a, of, a, of a interacting with the car is why does the car exist mm-hmm. like it's the ghost you need to drive transportation a car, is higher in the hierarchy transportation than, is higher than, than is higher understanding than how it works right? Right. driving the car is higher in the hierarchy than understanding how it works if you don't understand how it works obviously you're going to have a problem driving it but the reason why you even want to understand how the car works is because you have a goal you have a you have a yeah, utility you have a yeah utility so right? what and so that's that's what i think is higher it's just inevitably higher on a, any hierarchy of meaning it has to be purpose and goal and and the frame of you know the the category itself that you're then using science to 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 decipher, but those categories are meaning categories. They're not, they're not, you know you you don't. This is the problem of emergence. You can't you can't get to the higher level being just by analyzing its parts. You lay, just cannot lay out the hierarchy here with well, there's. Christianity is is a, a system of interacting between people, like an I an identity of of like you say a uh, a way that you're going to interact with the world and with other people in Christianity, and other people outside of Christianity. Like there's rules in Christianity for that as well. Uh, Scientology is a different way of interacting with people, and well, it's it's just one of the packages out there. Yeah. And science is a di- is a different way of interacting with people and and the world. 
there is a hierarchy there that Brett Weinstein would say science is at the top of the hierarchy because science can explain the workings of Christianity and of Scientology in a way that Scientology cannot explain the workings of science and Christianity. What If this simple hierarchy of three things, where you're saying science would be at the bottom of that hierarchy and Christianity would be above it, but where does Scientology well, the, fit in the, that hierarchy? Uh, the, the thing that's above the hierarchy is the is the logos. It's not Christianity. Okay, it's so like, uh, that's what I want to get at right there. So what's <laughs> above... What is above all, all science, Scientology, and Christianity? What is that thing? Well, the divine logos. Like the divine logos is the is the reason and mm -hmm. origin and end of things. Mm -hmm. And those those that you could see it as the highest version, but that scales down all the way down to anything you can identify. And so, any every category. Mm -hmm in terms of every category has a an unitive aspect to it mm -hmm. right has something which makes you know that it's one right even though it has parts okay okay and so i know that that's hard it's so hard i know we have to dumb it down to atheist speak here it's you really have to give me the materialist that. version of it okay because so, i i understand how metaphors so, work i okay I so understand. it's not a metaphor it's it's not a metaphor in a, in the in the simple sense so so let's say Let's say you you um, it's it's harder for smaller things because people because they see them physically together. So a chair is a good example. So there a chair has parts, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and those parts also have parts. Yeah. No, it's a conceptual and those categories. Those parts also have yeah. parts. Okay. So why do you think that a chair is one thing? Uh, a, well, it's based on the utility of the chair. Obviously, yeah. once once a certain amount of matter coalesces in a way that it has a certain utility. We start categorizing it by that utility. I'm you're talking to a Jordan Peterson fan here. Yeah. Like obviously, the the we want the drill for what it does. We want the hole that the drill puts in the wall. Yeah. We don't care necessarily about the drill. It's about the utility. Right, and so that that is not a scientific description, right? The you uh, the, the reason why something exists is not is not is not a. It's not a scientific description of that thing. You, you could you could bring it into a scientific description of something above it, mm -hmm. but not of the thing itself. What is the what is the utility in categorizing the world this way? Because Jordan Peterson connects this way of categorizing things to ev evolution. He says utility is what we're geared to look for. It's the same thing that yeah. Donald Hoffman is talking about. Yeah. Donald Reason. Hoffman is saying, you know, we look at things by their uh, evolutionary advantage. They're like a point system. So we don't look at them in a scientific way. Like we don't look at the chair and say, you know, break it down to its parts. We look at it as something that we can use to sit on. Yeah, exactly. But then that scales up like way up but in it, the sense that it's easy for a chair because a chair is physically, you can see it as physically together, but... Of uh, uh, let's say <clears throat> the category of all chairs are not physically together, mm -hmm. what? right? But but all chairs share an identity, like they they are a body, and they have a logos, which is above the individual chairs, right? And so that truth is higher than the analysis of what a chair is made of. So you're saying what's at the top of the hierarchy is just the system that we categorize things by it's the it's the reason the ability to things. categorize things yeah yeah something like that you could i mean i could i could go that far the ability to see utility in things or the inevitability of seeing utility in things in the sense that that's one of the reasons why they appear to us as categories in the first place right because because there is no there is no neutral reason to posit categories. Mm. Well, that's super is... interesting. But I mean, that is this thing that we do that we turn objects into utility. Like our people have said this for a long time like humans, that's what separates us from other animals. Now we realize that other animals use ter 
uh, tools all the time. I don't see how you can look at the elaborate nests birds make and think, oh, yeah, we're the only species that uses tools. Yeah. So, but you're. No, I think Logos, Logos definitely goes down into the chain of being. What is like, specifically, it's not what does Logos mean specifically? It just means, it means the reason, reason for things. Mm -hmm. And the reason for things appear in the way that they're ordered. So it has to do with reason in the sense that we understand. And so the 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 order of something, mm -hmm. so the order of something is bound up in its reason, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the order of the chair is bound up in the reason why the chair exists. Correct. Yeah. The utility, utility. that it has yeah. in the world. Man, we're making a utilitarian argument here. It's not a utilitarian argument. It's in my in my vision, it's more like a platonic argument. Because what? this this scales up in reality. Because the thing, the, the, the problem with the utilitarian argument is that it nonetheless posits a neutral reality. Is there anything above the, cate the uh, category system in the hierarchy? Yes. Okay. Oh, it's my God. God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what God does. God is, is beyond category. Mm -hmm. God is infinite. That's the one why the reason why we say things like God is infinite or God is is beyond all name, all definition, because God is the darkness out of which the categories come from. The 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 divine darkness is God creates people. the categories. God is the impetus behind the categories. The God creates the categories through the logos. That's why we say in Christianity, we say, you know, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and and it says that he created all things through the sun, through the mm -hmm. logos. So God, God doesn't create directly because God is beyond all categories. And so in, in the, in God, there's the, there's a principle of manifestation, which then manifests the categories. Mm -hmm. And so beyond everything, it's hard to talk about this stuff, man, it's hard to talk <laughs> about this stuff. So we don't have trying to. to talk about it at a level that, I hope, like, like I know that now at this point, what we're talking about, people are going to say, "Okay, Sky Daddy Fairy talk." Exactly, totally. No, you're like, on. I know you're on the right page. Happen. Sadly, it's, it's good that difficult. you're. It is good, John, that you're self-aware to know to know this because a lot of people aren't necessarily self-aware. They don't even really know the other side's arguments, so they don't know okay, what so, the other side is thinking. So think about it at at the chair level. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the chair, right? So you have a chair. Mm -hmm. Right, this chair has an order. It has a way for you to recognize that it's a chair. Yes. Yeah. Right. That that order is bound up in its purpose. The way that the way that you recognize it, though is in your head. It's not in the chair, correct? What is the chair without the category? Well, if you look at it like language, we come no, up. What with is different... the chair without the category? It's just a bunch of parts, and then those parts are also made of parts. Just a quantum field without a category. Right, but until somebody conceptualizes it as a chair and uses it for the utility, I mean, the the category of chair is inside our heads. It's just, I mean, a rock could be a chair. We, well, rock can function as a, as a seating place, not really a chair, but it could function as right. a thing to sit okay, on. Okay, so sure. I thought you were talking more broadly, like something to sit on. Like anything, I mean, yeah, it could be something to sit, to sit on. That's fine. It doesn't yeah. matter what the category is. Like it, it, it there, there are hierarchies of categories, mm -hmm. you know, and so they, they all, it's a dynamic hierarchy of categories. It's not just, they're not just one, one, and and also objects can have several identities. They don't have just one, right? And so you can, when you, if you, if you take a rock and you throw it at someone, it's not the same. It's not the same thing as the rock you're sitting on. Are you even? It's physically the same. Are you it, familiar there's a with transformation which occurs when you pick the rock up and bash someone over the head? Yeah, with it. totally. The utility changes. Like it changes yeah. categories as you use it. Soon the rock's yeah, exactly. a hammer. Soon like soon yeah. the rock is a a sling. Uh, it's totally possible for that to happen. The when you're this comes off a <laughs> bit like a presuppositionalist argument. Are you familiar with presuppositionalist? No, I'm not sure. I or, am. They have this argument, and I'm I'm not super uh, familiar with it either. But their argument is that without a belief in God, logic doesn't exist. So therefore, if you're using logic, you're basically admitting that God exists, which I I don't necessarily understand 
how they do the math on that one. But this comes off a little bit like that. Like if you're using this category system that I would argue is just innate in human psychology, uh, then you're admitting that a God exists because the God, the category system literally comes from God. You're saying God is the so, top of the hierarchy and the category it's system not a is mental, beneath. It's not a mental game. It's an embodied mm-hmm. experience. It's not as simple as just saying when you believe in God or whatever. It's mostly that that you... you so the, the problem is always this positing of something which exists outside the category system. Mm-hmm. Like what is this other thing that you, that you, that you posit? That exists there outside the no category system. There is no avoiding the category system. No, I agree. <laughs> I agree. The category system is like an innate It goes all the part. way down. It goes all the way down to potentiality. But I, w- I would argue in a Donald Hoffman sense that the category system is part of our user interface with the world. I would argue that it's operating inside our head, that it That's doesn't actually says, but exist in the world. But how does he have access world. to the other thing? What's that? He, he, seems, he posits another thing that he has no access to. Correct. Well, he does have access to it, but only through the user interface. But he's saying that the user interface uh, strips out so much information just for people who are listening and they don't know the Donald Hoffman argument, Donald Hoffman really quick uh, makes an argument that the real world is very different than the world that we uh, uh, see and understand. That we have uh, what is effectively a user interface, a graphical user interface like you use with your computer. Many different operations are going on inside your computer than what we see on the, depicted on the screen. We all understand the screen of the computer very well, and he postulates that all of science, for as long as we've been studying the natural world, all we've been studying is the screen, the user interface, and we've never looked inside the computer to what's actually going on. So uh, what we're talking about here is, I, I'm saying that that category system is part of the user interface, the screen, and not necessarily uh I, I i mean i don't want to speak for you john are you postulating that god is what is inside the computer no i'm postulating that there well, there is no other there's only the screen <laughs> no that's not what i mean but what i mean is that you can posit as much as you want another reality mm-hmm. that has ca- that some kind of categories behind the screen but it's always categories. Yeah, I agree. The rule manifests I agree. itself through meaning. Well, the like. So the way to the categories way to say are it, or as, the, categories are as essential to us understanding the world as pixels are on the screen. Like if you don't have pixels, you don't have a user interface. So, so the the Aristotelian or even Christian way of positing it would say that behind it is chaos potential. Mm-hmm. It's a potentiality, and then out of the, and then logos. Light Mm -hmm. logos comes down on potentiality and then forms identities into that potentiality. Instead of those identities are the realest thing because the potentiality is just potentiality. Instead of chaos, could you say raw materials? You you could say raw. I mean, I guess if you want, but it goes all the way down to a field of possibility. Like it goes all the way down to a field of, of, of particles that are possibly somewhere, right? That are that are fl- in flux, let's say. We, I've, I've got to wrap it up. I, yeah, <laughs> I know no, you man. have a hard out too, but this has been a fascinating con- We can talk again. Uh, All right. Hope, hopefully, like I... But it's not giving me hope, that's for sure, man. Really? <laughs> oh yeah, because I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing just how hard it is to communicate certain things to people who haven't had a certain intuition. Like it's just really hard to communicate. It's like... Trying to find words in a language which is another language is difficult. Yeah, I had I had one of my uh, uh, one of my fans watchers reach out to me, and they really like your stuff. They really wanted this conversation to happen. So, and they your stuff has been super meaningful to this person. So, I know that you're making an impact on people, and people people like your stuff, and there are people that understand it. I, I guess one of my things is I, I'm just I'm trying to bridge that gap. So many people see things that they don't understand and they have just like a visceral disgust for it. Like they think that it's a threat to their 
identity or or whatever yeah. it is. And I I don't I think that's just a bad way to look at the world. I think yeah. I, I mean yeah obviously I, I um you're a smart guy. I'm I'm. I'm trying to understand what you're saying. I, you're, you're, well, I, I do. I, it's not like it's completely a mystery to me. And I feel like mm. uh, what we've articulated here has, has been useful. I mean, obviously yeah. uh, people leave comments on this. People will, there are people on your side that might be able to explain things better that are uh, to sort of bridge that gap. And and same for you. People on my, on my side might be able to uh, explain things a little more to you. So. You, well, I hope so. I hope so. Don't and get thanks, frustrated thanks though. Why? Why are you? Sure. Don't get frustrated. Seriously, are you? I, I think I'm frustrated with myself. Like I'm frustrated with the 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 perception that there's definitely like a wall, mm -hmm. and it's like I and I know, and I know that it's a failure of my capacity to communicate it. Mm -hmm. And so when I see the confusion in someone's eyes, I'm like, damn. Like I can see in your eyes the confusion. It's, but I'm like, there's no nothing damn. wrong with confusion though. Like confusion yeah. is, I mean, that's well, it's where, wrong. It's annoying when you're trying to explain something to someone and you see confusion in their eyes. That's like, where well, I'm we, obviously not explaining it the right way because then I wouldn't see confusion in your eyes. Confu confusion is how we begin any engagement with a new <laughs> topic. I mean, it's yeah, exactly. that's normal. That's completely to be expected. So, the thing that bothers me is not the not. Not the fact that people are confused. I the thing that bothers me is people are dismissive. That's what bothers mm. me because there's absolutely yeah. no attempt to even even understand. So yeah. that's what bugs me. Well, hopefully people will, won't be too dismissive. Yeah. Well, well this was a great conversation. I'll, All right. It was I'm good gonna to talk to you, man. I'm gonna upload it to my channel. I can send you a copy if you want to upload it to your channel too. So. Well, let's see. Yeah. I mean, upload it. Send me the link and and, and I'll see how things go in the next few weeks. Okay. Take care, days, man. I mean. It was great talking right. to you. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.